Hi there, Glocal citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu, coming to you from... I used to, folks, I think I've spoken about this, but I used to live in the DMV area. And so every time I come back, I am astounded by the development. And so I'm down in the DMV right now. I'm in Virginia. And I just so happened to be able to catch someone who I was so happy to be able to catch. And so I'm going to read his bio and then you're going to get such a treat with this conversation. So he is an astrophysicist and author. STEM educator, multi-patented inventor, voice actor, TV personality, science communicator, and keynote speaker. He recently served as the Space Science Education Lead in the Space Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. His work has resulted in 11 patents and more than 100 publications covering contributions to astrophysics, cosmology, plasma physics, and the development of science missions, observatories, focal plane instruments, folks, <laughs> Detectors, semiconductors, manufacturing, and ion propulsion. Oh my goodness, these words. This is what life is, folks. So just let's, let's, we'll get there. He has co hosted and contributed to several shows on Science Channel and Discovery International, including Outrageous Acts of Science, How the Universe Works, Space's Deepest Secrets, Strange Evidence, You Have Been Warned, The Planets and Beyond, and Strip the Cosmos. He regularly appears on news programs and has won or been nominated for several awards for science reporting, including an Emmy nomination and four Webby Awards. His memoir, A Quantum Life, My Unlikely Journey from the Street to the Stars, was released in 2021. Hakeem Olushei. Yes. yes. Welcome yes. to the podcast. Thank you. Thank Yay. you for having me. I'm so excited. Yes. Let's, let's do it. Let's, yeah. do, it. let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. So let's jump right in. Go we're, Cardo. We're, yes. Go <laughs> Cardo. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> so we were just talking about this. We we have Stanford in common. We we're actually there at the same time, but he was there doing this amazing work for a little bit longer than I. But we'll talk more about that too. And so let's get started. Where are you from? Where are you local? And what is your craft? Okay, so I am from. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my mother's birthplace when her ancestors came to the U.S. They came to New Orleans, and so that's where I was born. Several generations later. My father's family is from Mississippi. So I spent my teenage years in Mississippi, my okay. teenage years and early 20s. So I'm, I say I'm from New Orleans and Mississippi, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. My craft, so, you know, that's a good question. I, I, I sometimes say I'm a science mercenary. Oh. Yeah. But, I'm be, but I do more, you know, I love to do media, right? I was yeah. a musician. I yeah. love to write. I love yeah. that. Do, do any sort of performance and entertainment. I actually did stand up for a while. Right? Okay, okay, yeah, my, I can see that. My team was like, "Dude, stop it! You can't, you can't do that. It was too raunchy for my brain." So <laughs> I'm like, "You know where I'm from? You know who I am? Right? Oh, I gotta be right. I gotta be funny." Yes. So anyway, so my craft, you know, it, it, you know, I just try to make it happen. You know, I, I like to follow my curiosity mm. and you know follow opportunity as it presents itself. Okay. So I do a lot of different things. So right now I'm completing my sec second book for public consumption after my memoir. This is a, okay. a, a science book. I have a contributor agreement with ABC News. Okay. I'm okay. about to launch a podcast okay. with a Roddenberry Entertainment and someone else is to be announced in a week. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got a movie deal with Oprah what? for my memoir. Yes. Yeah, yeah, wow. Was, oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Originally, right. I got it with, with Chadwick Boseman. Okay. But okay. after he passed, yeah. the studio killed the deal. Okay. And so we went back out and is in collaboration with Harpo and Tribe Tribeca. So I actually got to, to hang out with Oprah on Zoom. Okay. <laughs> like, okay. Recently with the film festival or just No, last generally? year okay. when we, um, about 18 months ago, 20 months ago when okay. we first started, started you know, started mm -hmm. discussing the deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a lot of that side of things. On the scientific side, I'm newly a member of a satellite team that's based out of Princeton. It's called the Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, the mm -hmm. IMAP satellite, right? Mm -hmm. And I also have an appointment at George Mason University mm -hmm. where I do a lot of education. I love to interact with students. Mm -hmm. And when I came here, you know, I basically went from being a professor to being more entrepreneurial. Mm. I wanted to continue doing the things that I love to do, right? I love right. to educate, I love to mentor, I love to research. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 
some other things may pay more. Right. <laughs> so yeah. And, yeah. and the other thing and about it is, is that when you do the the professor thing, it comes with a lot of administration, right? And administrative kind of work, right? Yeah. So yeah. now I can distill it into the components that I really enjoy doing mm-hmm. and where I feel like I'm really value added right. for, for the university for the students and sure. myself. Sure. So yeah. So I have the two academic appointments. I have the media work. I'm doing the writing. Okay. So that's your craft. But where would you say you're local? So right now I'm near DC. I'm in the DMV. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I moved here to work at NASA headquarters. The okay. position that you sure. described with sure. the science mission director. Okay. Okay. So are you still working on that or no. are you now just at George Mason and then doing all the other? Yeah, I'm doing all the other things. Well, you know, I, I was there and everything was going great. I love them. They love me. Mm-hmm. But my media team was like, Akeem, you're about to lose a ton of money, man. You know, if you're in the federal government, you can't just take money from anyone, right? And oh, so, yes, that's yeah. true. And so the thing, there was two things. One is I speak publicly about science. Mm-hmm. So I did a lot of public facing stuff for on behalf of NASA. Mm. And so it created confusion because I couldn't, you know, even though you can do these outside activities contracts, there were two strict rules that I had to follow. One was, I could never be seen as speaking on behalf of NASA when I was not. Mm-hmm. All right. So here I am showing up in the news to talk about some NASA mm-hmm. mission while I'm, you know, it's, it's. Yes. Yeah. 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 It, it's yeah. looked like a conflict. And then the second thing is you can't be seen as using your federal relationship to, for profit. Yeah. Right. Right. And yeah. so some rules around that were, it wasn't really rules. It was like agreements, right? Okay. The agreements were made if someone invited me for something to pay me, and they said NASA, then I could not charge conflict, you. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a conflict, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, as things started ramping up rapidly, sure. I become I became known more and more as Hakeem of NASA. So it was like, ah, you know, okay. what do I what do I do here? Sure. You know, you, you have a it's like that song by Eminem, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You gotta, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta take you gotta seize that moment right. when, it, when it comes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So so now you're you're in that space. Right. But I wanna I wanna go back a little mm-hmm. bit and you know I've read your book it's yeah. I re- highly recommend it folks because it's mm-hmm. a great story how would you describe how you've gotten where you are now well I ha- came up with a phrase for it I mm-hmm. call I call it hope hustle and help okay yeah. H-, H cubed there we go mm-hmm. yeah yeah hope hustle and help okay so on the first hand you know and, and this is something when you talk about this borderless world mm-hmm. right one of the things in, in terms of my own personal evolution is, you know, I realize the narratives that I bought into that are the common narratives of America. Mm. And, you know, it, it, it varies by neighborhood. So mm-hmm. coming from the communities I came, I grew up in, which were the economically depressed, all black communities for the most part in the West and in the South. You know, I lived in LA, I lived in Houston, I lived in New Orleans, I lived in Mississippi. You know, you, you sort of have this idea of where you belong in the world, where you can achieve that sort of thing, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And you can potentially edit yourself. Mm-hmm. But I was always like a weirdo type kid, you know? And so I bought in to that American dream. And that's what that hope was about. And now I've been around the world. I've been to 44 different countries. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the way they talk about the American dream is like a house or something like that. Right. But that's not the way I, I see it, yeah. right? I see opportunity, Mm -hmm. right? I see a a, a land where there's a lot of resources and there's an ease of life Mm -hmm. where you're not really, you know, when I was a kid in Mississippi, yeah, we were at a subsistence level, right? But, you know, nowadays, everything is modernized. Mm -hmm. You know, our infrastructure is so good. Electricity almost never turns off unless you're in a very rural place, horrible weather, you know. And so I see all those advantages that I have by just being here. Mm -hmm. But I I bought into the story of you could become what you want to do. So I had that hope, Mm -hmm. right? And I knew that I could work hard and achieve whatever it is I wanted to achieve, right? And growing up in the deep woods of Mississippi, Hard work was like <laughs> expected of everybody at all yeah. times, yeah. right? If, if somebody said he don't want to work, you know, that, that right. was like the worst description you yeah. could ever be assigned. Yeah. 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 So, you yeah. you know, I was hauling pulp wood at 12 years old. You yeah. know, you were, you're slopping the hogs, you know, you know, my sister's youngest brother-in-law, she married into a family of 14. Yeah. You know, we're going out here in these woods. Howard Lee was like seven, eight years old out here doing forestry, hauling pulp wood with us, right? I right. was 12, Chris was 11, Darrell Wayne was 13 yeah. with the dad, right? Right, and, yeah. And this is hard labor, right? Yeah. So yeah, so that's the hustle part. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But without help, oh my God, mm-hmm. I would have gotten nowhere fast. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so in my story, it seemed like these people just showed up at magical moments and just led me to the next step. Mm-hmm. You know, and without them, you know, there's a lot of people who become, mm-hmm. you know, who who change their station in life. Right. And you might have this sort of, oh, here are the great things I did to get here. Right. I don't look at it that way. Sure. I look at it like, man, let me tell you who helped me to get here. Because, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, it's so necessary. Yeah. It's so necessary. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and when people look at people who say, oh, how come you don't just raise it? You know, they have no idea right. of, of that starting place, what sure. it's like. You know, going to Stanford, like we said, and, mm-hmm. and seeing the difference yeah. in what people would talk about mm-hmm. it, their experiences was from mine. It was just like, man, I was blown out of this race before I even got to the starting line. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that would be the experience. Yeah. yeah. So you said a, a key thing. I like. I really agree with you wholeheartedly about the help side of things. Oh, yeah. And so you now, in one of your roles, oh, you're, yeah. you are you are very helpful in, in mentorship and, and all those things. So, yeah. so give us a little bit of an understanding of how that is weaved into the work that you do. Right, right. So, you know, it's an evolutionary process. Yeah. So first thing is right now, I'm the president of the National Society of Black Physicists, mm-hmm. which is, you know, it started somewhat as a means for African-American physicists to come together to bring a perspective to the world of physics that wasn't otherwise there, Mm -hmm. right? You know, we're in America, there are social events occurring. So these people who founded it in the the late, mid to late 70s, Mm -hmm. you know, they had just experienced the 60s and and the 70s. And so they were inspired to found the organization because of the event that occurred and they felt like that voice couldn't get out there. Then it became, for those people, a sort of persistence hack. Mm. In the field, it's tough for everybody. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're feeling isolated and and if you're running into people that, you know, again, everybody's going to get meanness in this field, but it's the character of that meanness. And so when you're in certain groups, you know, not everybody has high character. So they go for that easy thing. They'll, They'll come at your race or your sex or your religion or, you know, they try to do something like that. So what these people found was that coming together every year at this conference really helped with their persistence in the field, Mm. all right? Then at a certain time in the 90s, this guy named Charles Magruder became the president, and he started thinking about what can it be as a mentor network, Mm -hmm. right? And so in the last two presidents before me, Willie Rockward, who's the department chair of physics at Morgan State University, then Stefan Alexander, who's a professor at Brown University, they really amped up that mentorship thing. And so Stefan got a, you know, and we've become, you know, Steph, we all of us have done it. It's not just us, it's sure. all the members of the board, but we have relationships with top physics organizations. So it's not just let me minister to your human, your humanity, because I understand you and I know what challenges you may face in particular, but also let's make you the dopest physicist right. on the planet yeah. by working with the dopest physicists on the planet. Sure. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's one way it manifests. So it's, you know, it's evolved. So as a, as a, as a young person, I read a lot of, uh, at Stanford, right? I read, yeah. I read, you know, even at Tulane as an undergrad, mm-hmm. you know, I, at Cap Outside, we had a program called Guide Right. And we worked mm-hmm. with the famous Pineywood School, mm-hmm. mentoring young men mm-hmm. to get them to, to pursue higher education, which sure. is not something to take for granted. Right. And not only do you need to know that it's an option for you, you need to understand the nuts and bolts of how to go about it, how to choose a major, how to, you know, what yes. how this whole process works. Yes. Be, yeah. You know, so in my case, neither of my parents even graduated high school. Mm-hmm. So there was no one could, who could tell me that. Mm-hmm. So it was my peers mm-hmm. who encouraged me to go to college and who sort of like guided me until I made professor tribe mm-hmm. guys, you know, Richard mm-hmm. McGinnis and Gerald Bruno, right? Mm-hmm. And Dave Till. So then the thing that happened is my PhD advisor, Art Walker, was an African-American, even though he was super accomplished full professor at Stanford, pioneer in a couple of fields, he would still have to face yes. these attacks. Of course. Mm-hmm. And so by watching him and talking to him, he showed me how to challenge these things the right way, right? Mm-hmm. So the very mm-hmm. first thing I do is I go to Silicon Valley and they come at me and I survive it, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, I survive it and thrive further. And so then I became a mentor because everybody, you know, had this reputation spread. Oh my God, he, uh, 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 right? So people start coming to me. Oh, here's my situation. What do I do? Yeah. But it wasn't black people. It was all everybody. people. Uh-huh. It was all people, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 So then I, I 
while I'm in Silicon Valley, I'm teaching this class at the local junior college astronomy class. Okay. And people start coming to me after they take my class, like, you know, a semester later, and they're like, hey, you know, Dr. O, I didn't realize that science was so cool. And I didn't realize that I could understand it. Mm. So now what I've done is now I'm going to school full time and I'm going to be an engineer, right? And so people just kept telling me this. I didn't know what I was doing that gave people this like belief in themselves and understanding. Yeah. But I eventually coined a phrase because, and the phrase is, people always say to me, Dr. O, I thought I was dumb until I met you. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Yeah. And so later when I, you know, people reached out to me to do television. Sure. And believe it or not, it was a Stanford connection. Okay. This woman, I believe it. This woman was hired. Her name was Stacey Matthews. Okay. Or Matthew. She was hired to do a diversity recruitment for a particular show that was going to be on Discovery. So she contacted me and several other minority physicists. And we, hey, they contacted it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. None of us got the show. Okay. Yeah. And the show bombed. Okay. But after that whole process, she said, Hakeem, did you go to Stanford? I said, yeah, I did. And she says, I remember you. I was an undergraduate when you were a graduate student. I remember you used to help a lot of people out. So I'm going to help you out, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she got me on the science advisory panel. Mm -hmm. So at Stanford, right, I ran this program, Partners for Academic Excellence, Mm -hmm. right? And do you remember this woman, Tina Gridiron? Was she there when you were there? She had a position at the Black Community Services Yeah, the name sounds familiar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Among the Cap Alpha Psi brothers, you know, mentoring a lot of those cats, there were these, uh, these, um, that school in the movie Dirty, uh, what's the movie? Dangerous Minds. Oh, Remember? yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah when I they know. take the kids from EPA sure. and bust them. Yep. So I was tutoring mathematics there with Ann Ray Goins, who was the first black PhD in math from Stanford, who's now a professor at Pomona College. He was a subject of a big New York, New York Times front page article a few years ago okay. because of his mentorship work, right? Sure. Um, and, you know, this other woman, Dr. Melinda Johnson now, who's, who's somewhere on the East Coast or in, in Philly, uh, but, you know, I was always doing these mentor things and, and I just can't stop. Right. So once I became a, a professor, I have a research group now. So, I, you know, you find just like Art Walker's group, you know, mm-hmm. the, 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 the people who felt like outcasts would come in my group. So I had the gay students. I had the, the minority students. I had the country students. Right. You know, one of my best students, nobody wanted this guy, this grad student. He comes to my office to talk to me. Next thing I know, we're talking about all this country stuff, you know, squirrel <laughs> recipes. Right. And I'm like, dude, I can't believe you exist. And all these, you know, 20 years I've been in this field, I've not met another person who grew up eating squirrels and possums <laughs> or raccoons, right? Dr. Bryce Orange, so, you know. Okay, okay. And and so, you know, at Florida Tech, I, I created a mentor network, right? Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. Where I would empower my graduate students to uh, manage my upper class undergraduates to manage my lower class sure. undergraduates. Oh, wow. And then, you know, I knew the, how, how important a global perspective is. So I would take my students to these trips mm-hmm. all the time. That's how I ended up going to Ghana to mm-hmm. fra- to mm-hmm. Accra and Cape Coast. You know, I've taken my students all around the world. And, you know, it's typically a combination of this is cool and this is torture because, you know, you're on some mountaintop, you know. Right. You know, it's you know. deep in the science. Yeah, you're yeah. deep in the science. Yeah. I took, I took yeah. uh, Bryce Orange and his other PhD student, Dave Chesney, to this small island in the South Pacific, Mangaya. Okay. We literally were almost killed three times. Yeah. <laughs> Once we almost got run over by a plane. Oh my God. Once we were trapped in the cave of death for about three hours. And then there was a motorcycle accident at the top of the mountain peak. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it was all the great yeah. adventures. It right. was like yeah. Indiana Jones or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I love that perspective and that it is contributing to the field of, of physics science. Because I think it's so, it's very mystifying. You know, people yeah. think about it. They're so mystified by the sky and the stars. Right. And so I want to put a pin on that train of thought because yeah. I want to go back to why the where. Yes. So you're now in the DMV. Yes. And you mentioned that you came for NASA. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the why, the where of where you chose to be in this area. And yeah, yeah. So it's a it's an interesting story. So the first thing is, all right, so here's what happens with me in my career development. So I leave Florida Tech and I go to MIT for a sabbatical. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I become the chief science officer for Discovery Science. Ah, okay. okay. And toward the end of this process, 
I start getting these offers for being, you know, executives. But at the same time, I'm being approached to do, to host television shows mm -hmm. and I have to make a decision, right? So I submit a letter of resignation to Florida Tech. And my dean is like, no, <laughs> we're not gonna like let that. this happen. We're not going. <laughs> we're not going. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you a unpaid leave of absence and we're gonna find some way to keep you here at Florida Tech. Mm -hmm. Then a colleague who I know for many years starts recruiting me to NASA headquarters, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh man, what am I gonna do? And then this dream like TV thing is offered to me. I'm like, okay, here's what I want to do. I want to do this television thing and then go to NASA. Okay. All right. And so I leave MIT. I move to LA on a temporary basis until I leave the country for five months because the show we were doing was so dangerous. We couldn't tape it in the US. We couldn't get it insured. So we're wow. going to tape it okay. at this abandoned military base, American military base near Ipswich in England. Oh, right? wow. Okay. Yeah. A week before I am to depart, they call me and inform me that my show has been canceled because of a grave accident on another show. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Now I go from rags to riches immediately. Yeah. I don't even have. I'm living in the Airbnb that I have to be out of in like four days. Right, yeah. right. So I contact NASA and I say, hey, NASA, about that position. <laughs> <laughs> I know you said we were going to start in like May. Can we move that up? <laughs> and they're like, sure. Oh, OK. Yeah. So I hightail it across country in sure. December of, sure. of 2016. Okay. I get here. And what had happened is, is uh, Two years before that, right before I went to MIT, I went through, through a divorce. Mm. And in that process, I ended up getting custody of my son. Okay. All right. So the reality is I came here for NASA. Mm -hmm. I stayed here for my son. Got it. I didn't want to move him. Yeah. I wanted him to stay in the same school, mm. you know, and yeah. and that's it. You know, I yeah. promised that I was going to do that. And that's what it is. That's sure. what it's going to be. Sure. Right. So sure. that's why I'm still here. To, but then when I got here, I learned, wow. The richest counties in America are all ring DC. Yeah. And I saw how, yeah. what a great place for business this is, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's like you came through, everybody comes through here. Yeah. Yeah, everybody yeah. comes through here. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a very nice central location for me. You know, I can go to New York, right. I can go out to Miami. Right. I international. Can, yeah, international. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Only the West Coast is, is it, Right, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes I'll shoot over there for do something for a day and then come right back. Yeah. You know, like, oh, yeah. That was a lot of time on a plane to work. Right. A few hours. Right. Was, right. right, exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's why I stayed. I, okay. I, you know, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good, a good reason. A great yeah. reason, actually. Okay. Okay, so back to physics. Yeah. So, you know, I asked you kind of how you came to be where you were, but but tell us about when you fell in love with physics. Oh, my God. So it, I have always been in love with the natural world. Mm -hmm. It has happened in steps, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, I've always been in... So it's, it's sort of three things. Three, well, number one, I've always sort of have been very reclusive mm -hmm. and avoidant of people, mm -hmm. except for like one person, right? Sure. Who, yeah. I've always been into really weird stuff. Like, so in my youth, it, it was like into mythology, into all mm. that, like Loch Ness Monster, Oak Creek. Sure. I mean, Oak Island, right. ghosts, yeah. you know, all sci that stuff. Sci-fi generally, Yeah, right. sci-fi yeah. generally. Yeah. And then the natural world, right? Mm -hmm. So my sister comes home when I'm like seven, eight years old. She comes home from middle school with Edith Hamilton's mythology, and I just consumed that book, mm. all right? Then... I moved to Mississippi and I'm living in the woods, surrounded by wildlife, surround, you know, I have access to all this manual country stuff. And I was a little pyromaniac, right? I'd play in the fireplace, <laughs> but also had gasoline, kerosene, right. gunpowder, oh, yeah, you know, and, the... I, and I'm doing all kind of stuff, right? Experiments, man. I right. am just loving my time. And it turns out that you saw that while I was there, I read my first adult book, right? Uh -huh. I read Roots. Yeah. And now I fall in love with books in a whole new, mm -hmm. deeper way, right? Because the the way that the book created feelings inside of me, a movie in my mind, mm -hmm. I just started devouring books. It was at the age of nine. So at the age of 10, I decided I'm going to read my family's encyclopedias from cover to cover. And I did from A to Z, and mm -hmm. I discover Albert Einstein when I get to E and relativity. Okay. okay. And so I feel like Einstein really brought together that natural world and weirdness that I like. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. And, and so yeah. 
man, I became obsessed with Albert Einstein and relativity. And I'm like, I'm gonna teach myself this stuff. Sure. Right. And and sure. literally, I would just devour Einstein as much as I could. My mom would get me books from the library, whatever she could find, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that whole like avoiding people thing, you know, I was always in a book. So, you know. Oh, so it just made sense. It, it was less sense. it was less socially. I'll, I'll tell you what's 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 interesting is that once I got my PhD and I went to Silicon Valley and I was in these business situations, mm -hmm. I found that there was something about my brain that I couldn't turn off, right? So I'm in these business meetings. I'm supposed to be looking a person eye to eye, mm -hmm. but my eyes, just like I have been doing here with you, mm -hmm. counting the patterns in the world around me. Mm -hmm. So I go to the psychiatrist, yeah. and you, they, they diagnose me with a pretty severe case of obsessive compulsive disorder okay. and a medium case of social anxiety disorder. Okay. So think about that. Isolate and obsess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, so you just that was my youth. Deep dive yeah. on everything. On everything. Yeah. yeah, I don't take things in small doses. Sure. You know, I go deep sure. and, and just, you know, I feel like, I, I always feel really ignorant and curious at all times. Uh -huh. And so I'm just, uh -huh. I just can't turn off this devouring of information sure. element. Sure, right? yeah. sure, yeah. sure, sure. Wow, wow. Yeah. So, okay, so it started with just physics, right? So just well, understand. Well, no, it wasn't physics. It was, it was I mean, it was Einstein. So I didn't sure, really Einstein. see physics. Until. Yeah, astronomy physics wasn't really on my radar. It wasn't until okay. I had to decide in my mid-20s when I got to graduate school, what are you going to do? Okay. You know, and, yeah. and, and, and so because I grew up in a country where we built everything, fixed everything mm -hmm. ourselves, I wanted to do something experimental with my hands. I wanted to build something. There was one guy doing experimental astrophysics, Art Walker. You right. build the entire payload, right? Right. But I knew nothing about scientific rigor. I, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't. You know, that's mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's a whole other level of. Oh, I thought this was cool. Now I don't like it. You get into the nitty gritty, right, man. Like, you know, the details. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh wow, you guys are jerks because you know you present your. Like I remember, I was asked to. Oh, not any real experiments I was doing. Uh -huh. Ex explain how this other experiment that people are doing works. Yeah. So I make these little plots and I don't put error bars. And so I actually take a little bit of data to make the plots and I don't put error bars on the plot. Oh my God. My team ripped my spine out, <laughs> <laughs> set it on fire, and blasted it into space. Okay. It was like, dude, you're an idiot. Like, you know, it, it is brutal in our world. But the, the way it works is, it's just like, you know, in media, I, my, my attorney does these negotiations for me mm -hmm. and he sends me the, uh, forwards me the emails between him and the other side. It gets so contentious. It's like they hate each other sometimes as negotiating, right? Yeah. Then as soon as the negotiation is over, like, oh, so I'll see you at dinner. Oh, right. okay, you know, yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. like that with a scientist, you know, sure. you're a big idiot. Oh, you're an yeah. idiot, right? They're like, okay, let's go to lunch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let's go grab a beer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right. it, it's just the way it is, sure. right? You, you know, our, our default setting is... Challenge. Uh, challenge, mm -hmm. skepticism. Mm -hmm. You must defend every... Lip. If you didn't think of something, mm -hmm. that means you don't know it. That means you're an mm -hmm. idiot, right? Mm -hmm. you, you forgot to address something, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, you might think something is not worth addressing. Like, mm -hmm. oh, because I'm on this mountain, gravity is slightly different than it is on that hill. I didn't take that into consideration. So, you know, right. it's all these really subtle things. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you happened on it because of your aptitude for building Curiosity. things. Yeah. Right, right, right. But now I want to understand about the stars. So, yeah. so how did the stars become you know all of the things that i just talked about here in your bio yeah in terms of cosmology and and yeah. even the mechanics of it so right. in silicon valley yeah. i'm assuming you work for silicon i'm a conductor yeah, right yeah, exactly right. exactly and so how did you see yourself taking all of this science and right. then actually applying it and then moving that from you know the corporate world to right. the actual practice of yeah. going yeah well I did not, I didn't develop my career in that way. Yeah. yeah. The way I developed my career was, okay, high school is ending. What can I do to have food and shelter tomorrow? Mm. Oh, I'll sign up for the Navy. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm out of the Navy, oh, damn, what do I do? My, my buddies convinced me to go to college. I realized, oh, during the academic year, because I'm enrolled, I have a dorm and a meal plan. I'm good to go. But my first two summers, of course, I was homeless. 
Mm. Right. And that second summer, I got lucky because I got accepted into this research yeah. program that I never applied for. Right. right? right. And, and, and I learned that thing called research. Yeah. And I learned that it was a world where, you know, it seemed very different from the world that I lived in. We seemed very, you know, it was fully segregated Mississippi. Sure. Right. You know, every job I had was a minimum wage job and they were very hard to come by, very difficult to get. And when you got them, things weren't always fair. Sure. Right. And yeah. here I here I go to this world of physics and it's like, no, dude, we're not going to look over your shoulder. Work whenever you want to work. Right. And I'm like, really? And then at the end, they're like, oh, we're going to judge you based on the merit of the work you did. And right. I was like, you got to be kidding me. You know, right. you're treating me like I'm anyone else. And it was just mind blowing. Yeah. And so I was like, science is the place for me. Right. Mm. But I had no idea how to go about that. So when I go back from my, that first summer research program, I go back to college and, and drop out, you know, I'm failing because I'm sure. in the streets and all this, sure. right? But luckily, again, one of these magical people showed up. This woman, Cynthia McIntyre, shows up from MIT. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I started a conference to help students, the National Conference of Black Physics Students, it was called, mm -hmm. to, to help other African-Americans know that physics is a career and here's how you do the nuts and bolts. Yep. And there is where I learned about graduate school and what it took to get into graduate school. And, you know, and then I got my professor mentors, Dr. Bruno and McGinnis and Teal, who were like, dude, you know, you can still, like I had, you know, less than a 2.0, GPA at the time I, I dropped out, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. and you know, Dr. Bruno was like, "Hey, man, you know, you can, you do two good years, you can still get into top graduate school." And I said, "Top graduate school?" He's like, "Yeah." He's like, "You have the talent, man. You just got to like focus." And and they knew that I, unlike many students, so I got married very young by sure. 1988. And the reason why I got married was to get myself out the streets, right? Mm -hmm. I felt like I was gonna die. Mm -hmm. I, I found myself at gunpoint a number of times, mm -hmm. and I reasoned. I was like, "Listen, the only reason this didn't happen earlier." is because my mom required me to be home at a certain time, sure. right? Because when I was finding myself at gunpoint, it was between like midnight and 6 a.m., right? Right, you know? when you... Yeah, when I'm out there with the zombies mm -hmm. and the, right? And so I'm like, let me get married. So now I have to, I gotta work and do school, you know? And so they like hooked me up with a campus job in addition to my off-campus job, mm -hmm. you know? And I tell you, my last year in college, I got a job at the blood bank paying five dollars and 65 cents an hour <laughs> my friends and i were all like you got it made right. 565 yeah. right the middle wage was four dollars yeah. that was like big money right <laughs> and so the funny thing that happens is when we get to stanford my ex-wife and i yeah uh we she gets a job she had a, a semester left in nursing school okay all right so so the first semester you know from like September through the end of December, she just got a job. And she got a job at a sandwich shop. And she told me the story of when the woman hired her. Uh -huh. She apologized that she could only pay her $7 an hour. And when she said that to me, we literally started dancing in the room. $7 an hour. <laughs> you know, people, you know, yeah. you're, you're from Ghana, so you get it, yeah. right? You understand that yeah. there's levels to it. But the average yeah. American, you know, yeah. and we're, you know, in the 2023, <laughs> right. they're talking about the minimum wage be $30 an hour. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. world's different. Yes. Very different, yes. very yes. different yes. world, yes. you know? So when I got to the end of grad school, I knew I had options, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew I could go standard, postdoc, continue doing so. Sure. I was being recruited into Wall Street because mm -hmm. options modeling was right. new. And, and that's what I did. I didn't do options modeling. I solved <laughs> systems of differential equations right. computationally and yeah. modeled them, right? Yeah. Same thing, basically, yes, right? Yes, basically. So I was getting recruited to Wall Street. Yep. And I also started voice acting for fun on the side. Okay. And I was getting some play. I was doing a lot of work for MTV, believe it or not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I was okay. doing like wine commercials. Sure. And college commercials. Sure. And I was like, should I pursue this? You know, and I go to the career fair and I drop off my CV with these tech companies. And one of them, Art Walker, happened to have a buddy who was a vice president. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, this guy named Glenn Tony. Mm -hmm. And so I got to talk to Glenn about the semiconductor field, right? And he, he pretty much, you know, I felt, you know, I like to learn things that are new. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, if I, you know, I had just come to Stanford, you know, I left my country world, I knew the hood, I knew the country, mm -hmm. but I didn't know this fancy right. world of, you sure. know, people with, you know, yeah. education in their family sure, and, right. yeah. you know, all these options of career options, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what was going on inside of corporations. Okay. And I felt like, you know what, let me go do that corporate thing yep. so I can know what the corporate thing is. Right. And the fact that they paid twice as much as a postdoc didn't help. I mean, it didn't hurt, right? Right. 
it's like going to Silicon Valley. And man, I love it and hate it. Mm-hmm. Right? I love the, the, the sense of accomplishment I got mm-hmm. in it because it just seemed like, I'm like, man, this stuff is easy. They struggling. It is. This is some easy stuff. You know, yeah, compared to that, right? What yeah. I had just gone through. Sure, you know? sure, sure. So I rapidly got like all these patents in like a year and a half. You know, and and, and things are going decent. But I hated the culture. I mm-hmm. absolutely hated the culture. When the downturn hit, the way yeah. people started behaving, right? You know, the dot com bubble burst. Yeah. It really just turned me off. Right. And so I thought to myself, what do I really want to do for the first time? Okay. And I'd always been attracted to cosmology. Oh, okay. And, yeah. And so a mentor sent me this job ad, a gentleman named Keith Jackson, who was also president of the National Society of Black Physicists mm-hmm. in the early 2000s. He's like, I can't hear anything about applying for this job. And I did. And it, the dark energy had just been discovered. The fact mm-hmm, that the, mm-hmm. the and, and so the irony is in 1991, the summer between Tougaloo and Stanford, I did my first physics research at Berkeley. Okay. 1998, dark matter is discovered. And, and you know, one of the guys who's the leader is this guy named Saul Perlmutter. All right. So when I go to do my interview for this cosmology position at Berkeley, I have the interview with Saul Perlmutter. So I'm like really excited because I know, you know, this guy's going to be a future Nobel Prize winner. Sure. I get that. I'm like, wait a minute, you? And he's like, wait a minute, you? Oh. Because I changed my name. Right. He didn't know I was me. Oh and I didn't gosh. remember his name. Sure. But I worked closely with him oh in the summer gosh. of 91, right? Okay. Yeah, okay. because he was yeah. like a dead ringer for Woody Allen, you know, space yeah. you don't forget, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, Saul, he's like, dude, you're hired. Oh, so wow. I, yeah. So I go yeah. in there. Yeah. And this is when I start discovering okay. that I'm an inspirational speaker generally, uh, right? You okay. know, so when I was in the military, when I'm like with my fraternity brothers and trying to get people to rah, you know, I, yeah. I was an inspirational speaker, but I didn't know I could just go talk to general audiences and be inspirational. Sure. But what would happen is Saul would get these requests to speak. And he didn't want to do it. And if he was unavailable okay. mm-hmm. for whatever reason, they would call me or this guy, Andy Howell, who's now at the uh, Las Cruces Observatory in S- S- University of California, Santa Barbara, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, I, I started getting this feedback about how great my scientific talks are, yeah. right? And yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. So now I realized that I had a talent for helping people to believe in themselves and also to inspire them through this science stuff. Uh So I'm like, hey, there's a lot of people out there like me who have no idea about this stuff, who don't think they can do it, who probably don't even know it's an option. Mm -hmm. And if I go talk to them, there will be a lot more people like me here. Because let me tell you, when I first got into the field, I hated everybody. Because it's so elitist. Mm -hmm. It's so, you know, like Mm -hmm. three guys in my research group, they were sweethearts to me. Mm Their fathers were PhD physicists. Right, right. right. Like, even though they were nice guys to me, it didn't mean they weren't jerks to me at the same time. Sure. Right? You know, the well actually got that whole sort of thing, right? And so I was like, you know, I'm going to show them. You know, I'm going to show... Because it's almost like people feel like you have to be boring for it. But it's really a cultural judgment. Uh You know, and at Stanford, Uh I was judged to not... I wasn't judged on the merit of my work initially. I was Mm. judged based on how I came across, Mm -hmm. right? You know, so I I didn't speak the way I speak now, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, and and so... Yeah, you were just from the South, so... Yeah, I was from the Deep South. How many scientists do you see on television with a Deep Southern accent, right? right? It just doesn't happen, right? You're you're prejudged. And so I had a lot of boxes Mm -hmm. that led to being prejudged, right? And I, you know, I was always the type of guy who would be like, you know, let me gather the nerds to defeat the jocks, right? You know, I've always like had that underdog yeah. mentality. Let me gather the underdogs to yeah. take on the, yeah. you know, the ones who have it all, sure. right? Yeah, and so that's what I began doing. And that's what, and so luckily, I, I, I go to this one conference, National Society of Black Physicists Conference in 2002, and I'm on the, the bus with this from the show, from the airport to the hotel, and there's this dude on there, this white dude, the only white dude in the show. <laughs> and I go, hey, who are you? He's like, oh, I'm Kevin Han. I'm a graduate student at Stanford. And I'm like, no way, dude, I just graduated like three years ago. And we start chatting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool guy. Yeah. By the way, today, He's a senior scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and a uh, uh, principal investigator for the Europa landing mission. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. He's a planetary scientist. Okay. But he was a grad student at the time. Yeah. So 
I go to the conference and I wake up at 11 a.m. or noon or something. And I'm like, oh, let me go look at the talks in the afternoon. Yeah. And different rooms have different talks going on. So I'm walking past, you know, plasma physics, optics. And this one says physics in Africa. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm going there. Mm-hmm. I go in, because I was always Mr. Afrocentric guy. I changed my name to sure. Hakeem Watolu you know, yeah. before I went to Africa. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Then I'm like, yes. I go there, I'm like, okay, I'm American. But <laughs> still, love it over here, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I hear these Afrocentric graphics, I was like, sounds like you haven't actually been to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll tell you a funny story, right? Because I'll tell my friends who are asking me, I'm like, you ain't as black as you think you is. <laughs> I say it like the word because I was sitting in Cape Town with two African astronomers, mm-hmm. Tebe Mendupi, who's South African, mm-hmm. and Pius Okeke, who's Nigerian. Okay. And I said to Tebe, I come to Cape Town, it's not like anything like the other parts of South Africa. It's not like Johannesburg area at yeah, all, right? Different. And I'm like, you know, Tebe, when I'm in Joburg, if I don't speak, people assume I'm Zulu. What would people think I am in Cape Town? And he says, oh, here we consider you what we call a color. Right. Mm-hmm. right. So yeah. Pius OKK, the Nigerian guy, starts laughing. Uh-huh. And we're like, what's so funny? He goes, I, I have a confession. I saw your name on the program, Olu Shane. And I was confused because how could there be a Nigerian astronomy that I don't know? Right. And then when you got up to speak, my first thought was, who's this white man with Nigerian name? <laughs> In Nigeria, you are a white man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, no. right? yeah. yeah. And I'm like, it's complex. Right. This planet exactly. is more, it's not like we think it is. The narrative that I've been uh, under all my life sure. is not the reality of the planet. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, going back, <laughs> back to track, Kevin, I go into that physics in Africa session, and who's talking but Kevin? Okay. And Kevin is talking about how him and this guy named Will Marshall, who also <laughs> has gone on the great heights. Are you familiar with Jeff Bezos' sounding rocket? He takes people up. Yep. Mm-hmm. So on one of the trips, he took this guy who's a partner with Will Marshall. They have this okay. satellite business that takes pictures of every part of the globe every day. Sure. And they sell sure. that's their business. Yeah. So Kevin and Will Marshall were both students when they started this thing called Cosmos Education. Okay. Where they would go to orphanages and mm-hmm. schools. Mm-hmm. In, in Eastern and Southern Africa and teach them about STEM stuff, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. To teach them this. So Kevin, I'm like, Kevin, can I do it? And Kevin is like, dude, it's not a question of can you do it? You must do it, right? right? Yeah. But the problem was, like I mentioned, my wife in the book, we had separated. We had divorced. Okay. And in the summers, so every time my daughter wasn't in school, she was with dad. Sure. So in the summers, I'm a single dad. Yeah. And they went and did it in the summers. So uh, I couldn't go. Yes. So I'm like, okay, I can't do it. Yep. Kevin calls me in September 2002. Hey, there's a total solar eclipse. It's going to be in Botswana and South Africa. We want to pay for you to come do it. I'm like, I'm in. Yes. So that November, I took my first trip, went to South Africa, went to Swaziland as it was at the time. Yep. And that was it. Life changed. Mm. It, like the, the, the <laughs> students, the love, the people I interacted with, you know, it was a group of, of South African students, Swazi students, and these women from Kenya, who I'm all still close with to today, right? nice. And man, the heart, the passion that people had, it just like blew me away. You know, I I just, you know, I was like, where is this in America? You know, I I want this kind of passion. Yeah, and diversity of of everything. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. It was just people that really understood how education can be a pathway to a better life and how a STEM education is something, and, and but that hunger for like knowledge, you know, mm-hmm. for knowledge's sake, I just saw that in so many people, you know, mm-hmm. and and so I was like, okay, I'm gonna come here every year, and mm-hmm. I'm gonna work with you guys, mm-hmm. right? So I just found myself doing that. So the funny thing is, Susan Moravina was one of the Kenyan women. So that was 2002, 2006. She was also at Ghana. She was gonna co-host this Eclipse broadcast, simulcast with me. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. And it was at that meeting that she said to me, Hakeem, I want to become involved in astronomy now, right? Mm. Susan has become an international superstar in astronomy. Okay. And in 2013, this British guy reached out to me. He's like, oh, I need somebody to work with. I want to go to Kenya. I do this astronomy outreach stuff. I'm like, oh, I got the perfect person for you. Yeah. 
10 years later, they're married with three sons. Oh, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> I was just there, I was in February, right? Yeah. They have, yeah. they run the Nairobi Planetarium. Okay. You know, but people okay. know them all sure. worldwide. Sure. Right? So they're global. Yeah. And so that's, sure. you know, and, and then I became a professor, right? And that was yeah. sort of like. Yeah. So yeah. it just rolled. Yeah. It just keeps rolling. Yeah. 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 Which is, which kind of makes a lot of sense from just who you are and how yeah. you've, how you've presented in this universe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, on the one hand, Mm-hmm. Because I always felt like an outsider, mm-hmm. I never trusted that I wasn't going to get fired from my job. So I always had a side mm-hmm. hustle. Mm-hmm. Now people like gig economy, sure. multiple lines of income. Sure. You know, I was on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I only had one side gig. And then somewhere around 2010, I read this article that said the average millionaire has seven lines of income. And I was like, oh, it was like a light bulb right. went off in my head, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I started developing other things that okay. I was doing into business. Like, Got for it. example, as scientists, we all speak, right? Right, But yeah. we all speak for free. Right. <laughs> you yeah, know, we might get exactly. 500 to 1500 depending, sure, right? Sure, sure, And so I'm like, and again, I luckily meet this woman named Adora English. Mm-hmm. I was introduced to her by the woman who ran Science Channel. Her name was Debbie Myers. Okay. And it turned out that De- that Adora and I, we met here at the DMV, but Adora and I lived an hour apart. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. we started hanging out. She started telling me how to become a, a media person. Sure. And she's like, oh, you'll need this person. They cost this. You'll need this person. They cost this. You'll need this person. They cost this. And I'm like, okay, it sounds like I'm not going to do it. <laughs> right? Because as a professor, right, I'm just broke at can. another level. Right. I'm still paying yeah. check to paycheck. Yeah. I got, you know, yeah. my salary is like, what, you know, I, well, my summer salary plus regular salary, I'm making like 110K, but I'm still sure. broke. Right. You know, I got a yeah. mortgage. You know, right. I, I, yeah. Family, yeah. all those things. Yeah. 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 So, I'm, so I'm like, okay, I don't have the money to do that. So I'm not doing that. And then Adora tells me, she goes, hey, you know what? I'm helping the people who are organizing TEDx Orlando, mm. you should be the speaker, a speaker there. Mm-hmm. She's, she gets me in mm-hmm. and they write up a description of me on their, when they post it on YouTube. Yep. And they use the phrase science communicator. Mm. A week after that comes out, I get a call from a British production company who's making You Have Been Warned, yeah. this show that went global. Sure. And in America was called Outrage Tax of Science. Okay. In the Latin world, it's called Local Lab. Okay. But it was a worldwide hit, right? Yeah. yeah. But he said, I, I said, how did you find me? He was like, dude, I went to YouTube and I typed in science communicator and you're the only person who showed up. Wow. Right? That was like 2012, yeah. 2013. Talk about wordsmithing. Yeah. Today, yeah. everybody's yeah. a science communicator. Right. Every exactly. undergrad who's a sure. science major, they got their TikTok and yeah, that, right? exactly. YouTube channel. But back then, you know, still pretty thin. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so I stood out in that way. Okay. And I got that lucky break. Yeah. Right. And okay. so that led to every other show. That sure. one show you sure. know, led to every other show. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's amazing. That's going to do it for part one of my conversation with Dr. Hakim Olishei. Be sure to join us next week for part two of the conversation where you'll learn more about Hakim's global speak and his mindset hacks. As always, you can catch us with new episodes at GlocalCitizensPod.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Please like, share, subscribe, leave us a note, a review. It helps others find great content on the internet. And until next time, bye for now.